Good evening. I want to welcome you to both the Marjorie Mead Hooker Visiting Professorship Lecture, as well as our lecture series for 2017-18. So this evening, um, I have the pleasure of telling you about the Marjorie Mead Hooker Visiting Professorship, which is near and dear to my heart because I uh, had the honor and pleasure of knowing Van Dorn Hooker. So this professorship was established in 2007. And this, it, it is an endowed in the memory of Marjorie Mead Hooker, known as Peggy Tomeni, and um, was established by her husband, Van Dorn Hooker, FAIA, who was the UNM campus architect from 1963 to 1987. He passed away in 2016. Um, both his daughter, Anne Clark, and son, John Hooker, AIA, were involved in establishing this. Marjorie Mead Hooker was an architect who received a Bachelor of Architecture degree from UT Austin. There was a number of architects who migrated from UT Austin to New Mexico around the same time as they did in 1947. She was the only woman in her graduating class. She received her first architectural license in 1950 and was the third woman to be licensed by examination in Texas and the fourth woman to be licensed in New Mexico. Marguerite Mead Hooker was also the first woman to be the president of the Albuquerque cha chapter of the American Institute of Architects and the first woman to serve on the New Mexico Board of Architectural Examiners. There is a wonderful list that we are, it's a growing list of people who have had this honor. And just so that you get a sense of who has been recipients of this, it was established in 2007. And this is the, the list. Donna Robertson, Adele Santos, Will Bruder, Julie Eisenberg, Peter Eisenman, Stefan Banish, Mauricio Rocha, Iturbide, and Gabriela Carrillo Valdez, Jinhee Park, and now Ted Flato and David Lake. And so I will introduce here John Qualley, who will introduce Ted Flato. I've had the pleasure of following the uh, work of Lake Flato for many years. Um, and I've also had the pleasure of being the teacher of four of their employees. And I'm not sure Ted even knows this, but um, this is when I was back at University of Virginia. I taught Louis McNeil, Michael Britt, David Erickson, and Samir Ryan. All pretty good employees, right? Let's say, they're going to take so, over the club. So now you got to hire some of these folks. <laughs> so, um, the thing that I um, really appreciate about them as I got to know their work even better was meeting both Ted and David um, on AIA Committee of the Environment uh, uh, Awards, the top 10 awards. It's a very rigorous um, process. Um, I've been on the professional jury twice and on the student jury once, and it's an, a very intensive um, kind of experience because you have to document it's become more rigorous over the years, but you have to document what you have done and whether it has worked. Um, and so in addition to beauty, aesthetics, you know, a beautiful building, a, a functional building, all of that, you have to prove that you are reducing environmental impact in some legitimate way. And a few years ago, I was asked by a former colleague of mine, hey, would you be willing to be on its kind of super jury to determine who are the best of the first 10 years of the AIA code. And not surprisingly, Lake Flato rose to the top. Um, they have received more of those awards than any other firm. And uh, the perception was that it was, everyone was kind of expecting they were gonna get the award. Uh, and, and it was no surprise when we looked at the data and found out that that was actually true, in addition to doing amazing work. The 
the thing that I particularly enjoy about their work um, is that they are modest, both as individuals, they're extremely thoughtful, and they're very, very serious about architecture. They really believe in the importance of place and how buildings can fit within a place. Um, so without further ado, let's hear Ted. Thank you, John. That was a lovely introduction, and and uh, the students you mentioned are um, you know, we're lucky enough to have some remarkable talent. That's a big part of the success of the office. Uh, but those are sure, sure four amazing, um, amazing uh, talent that you just mentioned. So I I, had, I didn't quite realize that you had been there, for professors. Um, I um, so thank you for being. Um, for inviting me to um, this honorary lecture position. Um, I just met John and heard a little bit about his, his amazing parents, and so it's, it's quite an honor to, um, uh, to be asked to be here, and I'm, I'm extremely excited. And, and I will be here kind of once a month or so as part of a class, and I'm uh, uh, looking forward to getting to know the, the, the school and the students and, and more of you here. So this is a, so I'm going to start out. Uh, this is a, a painting by my sister of one of my favorite moments in time, which is what we call Flake Lado, which is uh, just happens. It always happens in August, the hottest time of the year, and we go out to this uh, beautiful place that's been in my family for generations. That's on the headwaters of the Oasis, and we all go and camp out together. And some of the lucky people get a, a little bit of air conditioning, but the rest sleep in tents and just stay wet. And this is a painting that we always, we do a photograph of, of the uh, of the uh, event, um, you know, on, on a Saturday night. So, uh, and and that place and Texas played. So I'm going to give you a little background on 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 our firm and me in particular, and then and then talk about um, some older work and some newer work, just to give you a sense of of, of what we find important. Um, and. The way I grew up and, and where played a huge part. So even before going to architecture school, I, we grew up right where the hurricane is hitting in Corpus Christi as we speak. I uh, grew up knowing the, uh, you know, knowing the, uh, the, the value of, of wind and weather and, and sun and shade. And, and so we did a lot of sailing growing up. And then we had a, a marvelous place on the headwaters the Nueces River which is in the western edge of the hill country, and the river comes right out of the ground in this very, very arid place, and, uh, and that played a huge role uh, in my growing up. And so the two of those um, then started, then once putting it together with, with architecture has informed the way we think a lot about architecture uh, since then. The, uh, so this is Flake Lado, the weekend, this was just this weekend, and we do these kind of Christo, Christo-like tents that we put up, uh, creating as much shade as possible. We pull all these canvases up with, um, with one truck. We have, we finally figured it out over years and years of doing come-alongs and all kinds of things, but we drape this one cable through a couple of trees and over a piece of pipe, and finally all the way over to a truck, and we just drive the truck a little bit downstream and it magically lifts all this stuff up. But uh, anyway, it's a, um, the, the uh, landscape of, of Texas played a, a big role in the weather and the, and the variety of landscapes and regional climates that we have in the state um, played a big part where you, where it, those kind of different landscapes screamed for different solutions from the flat plains, simple flat plains of, of North Texas to the, to the marvelous coastal edge, uh, to the, the hills and mountains, uh, central and west Texas, to the, to, the, to the area where we had even more rain of, of east Texas. So, um, and we were lucky enough, one, as growing up in, in the state, getting to know those different landscapes, but then later getting to work in those different Landscapes, and that and that set us up uh, rather well to then do work uh, kind of throughout the country and throughout the West, certainly. 
And part of the appreciation for those landscapes was appreciation of the architecture that was built by those who uh, needed to work with the weather, that they couldn't uh, afford to get it wrong. Um, and so these are some structures like in West Texas, uh, a fort structure, uh, Fort Davis, uh, where, the, where they, they understood the, the value of breezeways and, and, and porches and, and using uh, local adobe to build those buildings for mass walls and ventilation. And then, um, the, uh, and then the, the, the strength of using local materials like limestone, like this road cut, uh, very simple, easily uh, worked limestone from the central Texas and the, and the buildings that the Germans built when they first showed up in central Texas. So all of those, the, the landscape, the, the, the materials, um, the forms, uh, the simple agricultural forms that you find on the highways, um, both in New Mexico and Texas, uh, where people not, and, and we didn't appreciate those for their romantic quality, you know, really appreciating those for their straightforward uh, solutions to, uh, to problems. Uh, the challenge of just how you're gonna put roofs over large areas for you know, these poultry buildings or this image uh, in the lower part of the slide, which is a series of silos that were lined up between the San Antonio River and railroad tracks. And I had a house right across the street, right across the river from these, and just admiring those simple shapes and noticing from the, the changing shadow lines over the seasons. And just all of that, the simplicity of that architecture uh, had and still does uh, really resonate with me and many in the firm. And then the idea of these simple shell structures or the structures that ranchers might build, the upper right-hand corner is a simple shade structure that was created for working in cattle pens and it was just cable and sheet metal. And that this was an early picture that we took you know, many years ago, but it has continued to inform architecture today. Uh, the idea of recycling some of these materials that are throwaway parts from from different uh, you know from uh, uh, from different industries, and then the appreciation of the artists that have also enjoyed and appreciated the landscape, like Donald Judd, James Terrell, just these the idea of simple forms celebrating the landscape or celebrating the sky. Um, when I went to college at Stanford and the, the running fence was going on right while I was there and remember being uh, really taken by this amazing light structure that, that, that zoomed over and up and down the hills, uh, accentuating those, those beautiful simple hills. Um, so all of those have kind of built something that has very much informed us and then when we were, we started our firm, David and I, um, about 30 plus years ago, we had moved to San Antonio to work for a marvelous architect named O'Neill Ford, who I understand um, the uh, uh, Margaret and, and her husband knew, knew well from, from uh, Texas. Anyway, he was a really important you know, regionalist, modern regionalist, and he died relatively suddenly for us, and so we started our firm probably a lot sooner than we should have. Uh, and we were lucky, it was in 1984, and we started getting projects like this. Uh, houses that were in the country that, uh, where style very much took a back seat. They were, the uh, reason, the rationale for these, these early houses that we've, uh, that we've got were that our client wanted to connect to the environment. They wanted, they were the only reason they were going to these remote parts of Texas was to be part of the land and the landscape and climate. So these houses uh, had more porch than, than interior space. They a lot about passive heating and cooling and, and breezeways that you could roll off and close off. And, and then uh, this during that same era of, of taking uh, whatever challenges a particular client had to would, would bring to us like, um, um, obviously, in the, on this project, we had a, a very thin blood budget to begin with, and so we came up with the idea of recycling a steel building. So always, uh, but still the same notion of like this space right here on the right is a, is a big, huge screened room. So it was, they had a, they had a thin budget, but uh, the idea was to, uh, 
uh, still have an amazing house, and so it was relatively inexpensive just screen a, a big, huge um, steel framed space. And so, and and when we were doing these early projects, we were always thinking about how we were going to make them as well, thinking about who it was that was going to be building them, and thinking that it would, Gia would be delightful if that contractor or that subcontractor um, was in, as enchanted with the architecture as we were. And so it was thinking very much about how they got made and what we were gonna make them with before we were even you know, really finishing up the conceptual design. We were thinking of what the material, what some of the details would be. And so this is a series of, of air barns, as we call them, um, barns that were open air, that were what we called lighter than air, all out of oil field pipe, uh, recycled oil field pipe. Um, and the projects that we worked on at, in this early times also were not only about the weather and about the materials that, that might be available in the particular places where we were working, but they were also very much about the landscape and about how the buildings could um, interface and connect uh, quite strongly with the landscape itself or the form. And, th and this uh, ranch house was out in one of these large open um, areas in, in, in South Texas where you have moths, oak moths, uh, that almost feel like islands or buildings floating in a sea of grass. And we put the house adjacent to one of those moths and then, and then imagined a lot of times we would do sketches just like this, and I continue to do sketches just like this, where thinking of the building and thinking of the landscape simultaneously, and so thinking of the outdoor space with as much emphasis as the indoor space, thinking about how the buildings can circle up a landscape. You might, you know, have you might be floating in the sea of grass, but to then have a contrasting courtyard space, which is what this is indicating and thinking of what the quality of that space. So in this particular case, you would drive up, park under the shade of these marvelous old oak trees, mod of oaks, and then go through simple wall, and then, um, so, and then, and then you come into a, this kind of oasis-like space, but, so these, these projects were thinking about connecting in, to the weather, but also connecting to the land and creating uh, uh, contrasting landscapes as well. Um, and then one of my favorite projects from that, this whole early era was one that was completely off the grid that we did where it was just the, the main kind of infrastructure building was just a curving stone wall and, and basically a big open roof. And, and so there's this, so it's like kind of a half of a stock tank floating on the, the on a, a landscape. Um, the main living space was all screened. And then the wall was to the north, because in this area of Texas, we get a very set prevailing breeze off of the Gulf from the southeast, and then we get a cold north wind. So it's a very predictable uh, weather pattern. And so this building is just that. We called it the Hakal, simple wall in the north, curving to block the wind, and then an open air screened um, building. So, so I, I, um, so I think of, we think a lot about our work uh, in in terms of the landscapes uh, where we're working. So I've organized this talk into the six landscapes, and actually there are a couple of books on our office, and they're also all organized by the landscapes. So it's it's the way we have always been thinking of our work is. Uh, is, is where it's built, and, and, and that's the connecting thread often between uh, the buildings and those, and those chapters and categories. And so, so I'm gonna walk you through these six different landscapes, and, and there, there's usually kind of two projects, a different scale in, in each one, and, and, and the age is kind of sometimes they're, they're more current and sometimes they're older. And so when I think of the brushland, I grew up on the coast in South Texas, and uh, South Texas is this uh, big, open, uh, wide, flat landscape um, that you're familiar with. Uh, the, you know, it's, it's not unlike some of the landscapes of New Mexico. Uh, in our case, it's you know it's, it's, it used to be an open grassland, and, and now it's more mesquite and chaparral and stuff. And this was an ideal project, and it's very similar to a project that we're working uh, with 
um, with Jeff and, and, and Gabby on, on the, uh, the class that we we're working uh, together on uh, here uh, this fall. And it is uh, here, the, the project for the class is the uh, Valle de Oro that's, that's uh, south of downtown that is uh, adjacent to the floodplain of the Rio Grande and it's a, it's a, it's a, a bird sanctuary and, and it has many of the same issues that we attacked on, on or, or um, worked with uh, on this project. And, and the Rio Grande you know, ultimately does make it to Texas and it ultimately does, uh, in good years anyway, gets all the way to the Gulf and in thinner years it's, it's kind of dried up and barely makes it there. Uh, but it is, traditionally it had an amazing rich, as you well know, it, it used to flood and, and then it would, then it would recede and it had a, an incredibly fertile edge that, um, that is very different now. It's now it's, uh, now it's controlled, it has dams, uh, there are dikes, there are sakias and irrigation channels and, and uh, in this case, this, the, there's a big flyway that goes down through southern Texas and this project was called the World Birding Center, and the idea was to uh, create a visitor center uh, in a really important flyway area. And our site um, was adjacent, it's this area, so the Asakia, or this irrigation channel, was on, uh, on the edge of, to the left of this irrigation channel, uh, was amazingly beautiful Tamalican leaf and scrub, the, kind of the original landscape from down there and a great bird habitat. But our site, which made a lot of sense where we were gonna put the building, was on already kind of destroyed or, or, or abused, uh, an, an abused onion field. So that is the land to the left. And so our, this amazing opportunity to build this, uh, this uh, visitor center for birds was just gonna be in the middle of an open uh, onion field, but adjacent to one of these irrigation channels. So, so we thought first about what we would build it with. It's an agricultural area, and so we thought these wonderful shell structures, not unlike what, you know, certainly Lou Kahn thought of when he thought of his, the, the beautiful simple forms um, at the Kimball, just these very, very simple agricultural forms. We thought, well, that would make sense in a big open field. So we used, uh, so we, it was our first opportunity to use one of these shell structures, and I think it's probably, probably the last time we used it too, there's a little bit of issue of, of, of leakage through the screws, but, but anyway, um, on this, let's see. Yeah. So started out with this simple sketch about the idea of how we would start to use the building to start to mend and repair the landscape. And so putting it parallel, it, it, luckily the, the uh, irrigation channel ran um, east-west, and so we could have um, long axis east and west, so main exposure would be to the north and the south, so that worked out. And then we thought how to begin to create a habitat for those who are just, uh, just enjoying the visitor center and they may not even have enough time or they may be in a wheelchair or elderly that they wouldn't even be able to venture out into this amazing landscape that was uh, to the, to the below this uh, irrigation channel. So we thought, well, let's imitate the way uh, the Rio Grande uh, once performed and where it would flood and then dry up and flood and dry up and build an, a, a new uh, burden landscape in between the buildings. So use the buildings as edges and create these lush uh, courtyards. And that is, uh, so that's what, what we, you see here. This is really early, shortly after it was built, they're much, much lusher landscapes, but we now, so we funneled the water off of the irrigation channel, and then we also thought a lot about how the water would come off the roofs as well, and created these little shady connections between these simple shell structures, and with this lush, remarkable landscape, that this is then during flood moments, and then we, then we, we would dry it up, and you'd get uh, some remarkable habitat, and it happened pretty quickly, and the, the beautiful thing about, creating habitat adjacent to a building like this is that um, you had people that could really take a little bit more time, sit in a chair, sit in the shade, and, and stare at a, a smaller body of landscape. And, and we found that they, uh, uh, by creating these little zones adjacent to buildings, we ended up finding out that 
that the um, that they noticed that there were some butterflies that they had no idea that this area even had, and it was because you were really spending more time just adjacent to nature. And then when we did build out in the Tamalipan scrub, we built these very lightweight, thoughtful structures that had screw footings and no concrete. This is a hot viewing tower, but, but light on the land, and so treating the land in a, in a, in a very different way uh, in, that, in a more fragile uh, wetland landscape. And another one of my favorite projects that we worked on was one just for horses. This is a little bit north. This is kind of more central Texas, uh, but still qualifies as the open flat plains of Texas and uh, for cutting horses. And here, uh, just thinking about, you know, because these buildings obviously are for, for horses, they wouldn't have any kind of conditioned space. So it was all about how to create really comfortable space, shady space. Um, and durable, out of durable architecture for uh, uh, these horses. And so we did, this was kind of a tour de force for us in recycling oil field pipe. Uh, we built a number of projects over the years uh, with uh, what was a relatively inexpensive commodity, which was used oil field pipe, and then, um, and then pushing it and, and welding it and thinking about the joints and connections. Um, and, and here we had just the whole campus of that kind of architecture. And one of the nicest things about it is all of this was on air conditioned, so it really was a lot about thinking about how the cross breeds would come through, how you uh, temper cold uh, north winds. We used, uh, we had, this is, uh, this is a, an arena to the right on this photograph. It was all perforated metal. So huge, this is the building. It's all, all perforated metal. So. It would, uh, you would, you could still get a, you know, a reasonable breeze through here, but you would close down the, the really aggressive winds. Uh, and so it was a, a really pleasant place to work in. Um, the desert for us is, um, is uh, as you are probably lucky enough to get to experience, is a remarkable landscape in the sense that it's, uh, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, it's incredibly dramatic compared to the, some of the landscapes that I was talking about and that we would in, encounter in, in South Texas. And so I'm showing you two projects that we did in Phoenix. One, um, a new campus for, or a relatively new campus for Arizona State University in Mesa. And the uh, image on the uh, upper part of the slide is the uh, original campus. It was an Air, it was, uh, Air Force, um, uh, campus originally, and so it was all, it was long on asphalt and, and pavement and, and really dull, simple buildings, and uh, had nothing to do with the remarkable desert landscape that was just, you know, with practically within a rock's throw of the site. And so the, the uh, and, and, and in this particular case, we had enough square footage, I think we had a, uh, maybe a hundred thousand square feet, a couple hundred thousand square feet of building to build on this site, uh, maybe 250,000 square feet of building. So we had enough square footage that uh, we knew we could really uh, have a transformative opportunity for a campus. Uh, but, but, the, but the idea of, of bringing back the desert to this campus was what it would desperately need it. So we collaborated with Christy Tenike, who's a landscape architect, at that time in Phoenix and, and now in Texas that we often work with. I think she's come here and lectured a few times. So this is this simple diagram that we did early on, thinking about it, thinking broadly about the whole campus. So the buildings on the upper part of the slide were existing, kind of some existing buildings, some existing Air Force buildings. Uh, the, the sward, this kind of yellow and, and green sward uh, running through it was the idea of a new, uh, a, a new campus commons, but unlike maybe Virginia where it was a campus green, in this case it would be a desert sward, uh, so celebrating and bringing back uh, 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 the desert in the middle of the campus. Um, as you know, Arizona, New Mexico get these incredible monsoons, and so when you do get rain, it's a deluge and it doesn't last for very long. So the idea was rather than piping it down below grade, we would use this uh, desert sward as our, our way of slowing down the water and using it on the surface and watering and then, 
and, and, and having kind of this uh, rich desert uh, interior. And then, and then thinking of the buildings that we're actually building are the ones that are all down below. And the idea there is to circle up landscape spaces that would be these luscious courtyards that would borrow more water from the buildings and from the condensates and we could afford to then have kind of smaller, cooler spaces in between. Um, and so this is that desert sward uh, that is more of a almost a natural drainage area for, that you'd find in a desert and, and now a really lush uh, space. We thought a lot about where we were putting the buildings, so we put the buildings on the southern side of this, uh, this new campus. Uh, uh, desert sward and and so you're walking in the shade um, and then that water ultimately ends up in a, in a large collection uh, amphitheater space and and thinking of the what we build those buildings with uh, rusted rusted steel things that would weather well in the desert um, and in this case we had uh, a little bit unlike Albuquerque, uh, you know, the weather in Phoenix is not as severe in the winter, so we could afford to do more open air circulation than you might do here. Um, and we had in the in the program of this particular uh, campus, we had a lot of circulation, and the idea was to also we had a pretty tight budget, and so we put a lot of that circulation outdoors and created these two, these three-story volumes that felt like kind of shady canyons and put shaded perforated metal up on the tops of them and uh, really extroverted all of that circulation and then thought a lot about how that could cool the buildings and then how the shade systems would, would cool the buildings. So a lot about uh, airflow and shade and, and orientation and then getting these little high spaces uh, to overlook both our campus, our desert campus sward as well as the mountains at, at a distance. And one of the things that I really enjoy in our office is that we work often, simultaneously we're working at different scales. Uh, we'll be doing a project at that scale, university scale, and then we'll be working on a house, and sometimes they'll be in the same spots, and in this particular case it was. We were doing a house in Scottsdale, so really close by, same time and right in the middle of kind of one of these uh, neighborhoods that was adjacent to a golf course. Um, and so the idea on this is that, and the opportunity on this was that whereas that the building at ASU uh, was delightful in thinking about um, uh, large numbers and big shady spaces on this building, we could think more about the craft and how things went together exactly um, and, and a little kind of finer, finer finishes. Uh, here, we just, um, same weather, so we thought, well, we would do just one big, enormous roof that floats with walls uh, that fly out into the landscape. Uh, so you would have uh, spaces, indoor spaces like this with glass and then, and then uh, walls beyond uh, with big, big eight-foot overhangs that, that mask that line between what is an interior space and what is an outside space. So really thinking, Thinking about the outside space and the inside space is one space together, um, and, and here are more rooms that do that same thing, of thinking of the quality of that, that courtyard as part of the room inside. Um, this was done by, uh, the, this was built by a, an architect, um, building a builder architect in Phoenix, who we've gone on, uh, they're called the construction zone, and they, and it's one of the things that I found delightful in working in Phoenix, and it's one of the things that you could take advantage of is that um, I think maybe it even started with Frank Lloyd Wright or others, um, Paolo Soleri, perhaps the, this notion that architects could also be builders, and so there are a number of architects that come out of ASU that then become contractors, and so it was the first time we got to have um, smart young architects being our superintendents on these on this project, and and later, and it was so easy that they 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 so totally would get what we had drawn, and then and then when there were a few things left out, um, didn't really require very much in the way of explanation. They they got it, and they could kind of complete the project. And we had, we've gone on to build a lot of projects throughout the country with that same group. Um, in the mountains, it's just a, you know, it's, it's an even more or even less forgiving landscape sometimes because you can get up high and you can see for miles and you can see for miles. And if you put some kind of architecture in that landscape, you know, you're going to be seeing it forever. And so in this particular case, the, this is the kind of wide open uh, 
um, valley um, uh, near the Yellowstone, uh, Yellowstone Park in, in, in uh, Montana. And, and here the idea was to, uh, to uh, take some cues from the earlier architecture of the, of the mountains, the idea of uh, benched-in architecture that would use grass roofs, old sodbuster roofs, and then, uh, and then the open air, the, mo the living space, uh, thinking of it more as a kind of a pavilion, an open air barn. And so most of the architecture here, uh, the bedrooms, the bathrooms and things are burned into the hill and just the main living space is just this one simple roof structure. So something that really felt uh, part of the landscape, worked well with the weather, um, opened up uh, to the south, uh, but dug into the north. And, and you know, a lot of times for us, if we're with that conceit that we're gonna be using um, part of the building with earth on top, naturally it would have to be load bearing, um, so using a lot of concrete and then using that as part of the ornament for the project. So we're very, very long on working with thoughtful structural engineers because structure plays such a huge role in the, in the, in the ornament or the beauty of, of our buildings just because we like um, uh, you know, expressing uh, how we're making the building. So, and another category of the hillside. So, in this case, I'm going to be I'm connecting two completely different areas: the hills of, of California and the hills of Central Texas. And the, this this particular project here is is an urban uh, visitor center uh, that is that that's in a, it's in a 300 acre uh, park in the inside of uh, in the interior of San Antonio. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the next one I'm gonna show you is one in California. Um, uh, here, the, uh, we're using limestone because that uh, makes a lot of sense when you're working in the hills, certainly of uh, Texas. Uh, and, uh, but, the, uh, but the big picture here was how this, this building interfaced with this overall 300 acres. And in, in our case here, we had um, a lot of parking to think about, so we had a lot of surface runoff. This is also a project that we were building at the time after a seven year drought in Texas. So the idea of how you would keep um, a lush landscape alive was critically important. So what you would do with surface runoff couldn't be more important. So this project was all about having a remarkable landscape that you could walk right up against that would have been, that was surviving really solely from surface runoff. So we used the parking lot as the beginning uh, source for the water. And, and that's what this diagram is showing. The, uh, image, the, the parts with the little, um, to the left are, uh, are parking cells, and then they, would, they were sloping and organizing to go into this kind of central waterway, which was only wet when you had a lot of water runoff. And then the building itself was also working as a series of check dams that would also catch the water up above it. This is on a slope. This is part of why it's in the hill section. <laughs> And uh, so the water running off this upper part of the hill, uh, the building is sheltering or, or pushing the water down to this main central spine of water. The cells of parking were pushing it back to it. And then ultimately it was watering the landscape in the park, in the, in the parking lot, but most importantly watering this kind of central water sward that went through, uh, that, that, that captured, you know, if you parked your car, you'd walk over, you'd walk down this, kind of lusher green space that I'm now gonna show you. So this is this, so we're now walking from the parking and, and that woman and the dog is walking across this little, uh, what is really basically just a, a, a big irrigation channel um, that is quite lush when it's really, really wet and it looks like rocks when it's, when it's really, really dry. Uh, and then the walls to the left were uh, these walls that are angled slightly that are catching the water and then running it off. Uh, in, in this one direction. So then, and the, uh, and the story there, because it's a visitor center and it's all about education about water, is telling you that story as you're walking through it. And this is, uh, and then the, you know, the water coming off the roofs and what we did with it. And, and then this is that irrigation channel that in this kind of lush condition, in the dry condition, it's just rocks. Uh, and then a little bit of water to animate the, some of the smaller courtyards coming off of uh, the condensate drains uh, and, and some of the 
water that we stored and collected uh, from that long irrigation channel. And, use, and, and being, we've used limestone so much on many of our projects where we're working in Central Texas and the uh, idea of celebrating that material. Uh, if we sometimes use it just as walls, you can afford to have little gaps in it and, and, and light spaces and air spaces coming through it. Uh, and in this, in this case, it was just a simple pavilion gathering space that sits on the edge of three or four different little ecosystems. Uh, so you're looking out over the kind of savanna of that space. And then this um, marvelous opportunity uh, in, a, in the older section of wine section of California uh, near um, what's well, Paso Robles, if anyone knows where that is, or it's, it's near uh, 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 the, uh, oh anyway, it's in the central part of, of uh, California near the, near the coast, uh, so you get some amazing weather patterns coming off of the Pacific. Uh, very, very steep hills. Uh, most, of the, uh, uh, most of the caves in this area for the wine storage is, is dug into the hills. In our particular case, we found it more affordable to kind of build onto the edge of the hill. Uh, and, and so one of the lovely things about taking on projects like a winery or a visitor center or, you know, it, it, it is just this idea of getting to know systems, in this case, uh, wine making systems and having the building express uh, as best you can the, the making of the and the celebration of that. Let's see, sorry, I went kind of fast through this. Oops. So getting to know grape making. Um, then thinking, we, we had some existing, it was on an old uh, winery, uh, and so we had an existing building that we were thinking, and ultimately we did reuse, um, and we put the cave, these drawings are kind of difficult to understand, but we put the cave um, on the side of the hill and put a big, uh, you know, uh, a big turf, uh, uh, well, a lot of earth and then and then ultimately grass over the top of this but the main winemaking building was a, was thought of as this really simple machine adjacent to this big green cave um, but it was a, all uh, naturally ventilated and naturally uh, and, and uh, naturally lit um, and so the thinking of how the windows would operate at different times of the day to keep it cool and then thinking of the quality of this cave space uh, board form uh, with these kind of simple um, skylights that chop through the grass roof above. And so this is the cave part off in front of us that's running down these sets of steps and those uh, simple, uh, simple wine making building. So that nice contrast of machine-like and nature all kind of together. Um, and then certainly one of my favorite landscapes to work with is one that has water uh, involved. And, uh, and in East Texas, uh, we get you know, an enormous amount of rainfall. So it's more like the South. And it's the, you know, uh, it's the thick pine forests. In this case, it's all, and we're close to the coast here. So cypress swamps. And this is the site. And this is another urban park, a 300 acre park in the middle of uh, the little town of Orange, Texas, and it, Orange is maybe a town of 20,000 people or so, um, very rural, um, a population that really doesn't, didn't appreciate, often doesn't appreciate um, nature. We had an amazing director on this project who had been a high school uh, science teacher, and he found that if he could connect kids to nature, he would, he had, um, he had a, a great opportunity to turn them into very thoughtful uh, uh, citizens later. And so he had been using this, what had once been a park, I mean, it had once been a, a, a very wealthy, kind of the wealthiest guy in town's, uh, uh, his uh, garden, and he had built, uh, Letcher Stark had built this uh, lake that was surrounded by azaleas, and it had gone, uh, had, there had been an incredible freeze, and the land had, and it broke into his heart, and he'd left this land to go to seed, and it was right in the middle of town. And once he had died, the foundation was set up, uh, it was time to turn this, what was just a space the city had grown around into an urban park. But it had been very used to um, 
having a, a, a it had become a, an amazing bird sanctuary. Uh, some of these ornamental ponds that he created out of wetlands had, had later turned into remarkable uh, rookery. And so with the challenge here was to think about how to introduce a new visitor center and people to a place that had gotten very accustomed to not having people in it, even though it was surrounded on the edges. It had a, a, a bayou on one edge, so one natural edge that had protected it all along, and then high fences before. Um, so the way we thought of the new visitor center is to place it where there had already been some existing greenhouses. So we didn't want to put the visitor center out in this remarkable landscape. Instead, we thought, well, we'd build a compound around some of the existing greenhouses and create more of an urban uh, edge building uh, that you would then um, venture out into the landscape from there. We had a, it was a great collaboration with uh, architecture firm called Studio Outside, and um, and it was, uh, the, the reason I'm showing you this image, so these are a series of buildings that a visitor center might have, an auditorium, a, a place to eat, a bookstore, offices, um, uh, exhibitry, kind of those kind of things, but we were thinking a lot about, well, as we place them, what is the story that, what is the, the quality of that space between the buildings, and in this particular case, um, we had um, we had this lake that we were inheriting from Ledger Stark that had been an ornamental garden carved out of wetlands, but over time it had become an incredibly polluted body of water because it had become a rookery and, and, the, and the herons would, you know, um, uh, do their droppings in the water and over time it was, um, it had a lot of algae build up and bloom and stuff. And so what we thought of the new visitor center as kind of the new lungs uh, or the new bladder, maybe, of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the lake system. And we would run that kind of semi-polluted water through a series of wetlands and then ultimately use the visitor center buildings and their grounds as the final kind of cleansing system for that, uh, that, uh, that water system and then return it back to the lake in a, in a, in a cleaner way to show that, that um, engineering can start to um, surmount some of the challenges that, that man had created or Ledger Stark had created when we first did this, this project. So all these buildings are, have a whole story about a series of wetlands uh, that are more urban wetlands. And it almost looks like a sewer treatment plant where you have um, wood walkways and metal walkways and, and organized cells that have different uh, plants uh, doing different things uh, and then ultimately doing what nature does naturally, which is return that water in a, in, a, in a cleaner manner than into these wetlands and then on into the lake. And then when we did build out in the landscape, uh, thinking of the buildings more as little floating islands or almost like boats, uh, we had this one off the grid main screen shelter and then we had uh, bird blinds that were basically, man had very little impact to observe the, these um, herons in the rookery environment. And then one of my favorite things was we used the bayou as our method, our transportation method. And so we used electric boats, and used the bayou. So we didn't put paths out in the 300 acres. Instead, we used the waterway to uh, access these more remote sites. And then we had these little uh, pavilions that floated around with all of nature still uh, undisturbed uh, as these little off the grid uh, shelters to you know, to appreciate nature. Then uh, a more recent project is one that's right on a lake, uh, and it's just in the lake category, and it's just a, a new project for a friend that I enjoyed showing. But in here, it's, we had this interesting uh, opportunity to, to uh, build on a lake, a constant level lake, part of the Colorado River system that has a series of dams um, before it gets to Austin. And uh, in this case, we had a, a road parallel to the lake so we could build right on the lake on one side, but the main house is on the other, and how you connect it to the lake when you still had a house on the opposite side of the road. So you can see this is the road cutting right through the property. So we put we have this boathouse on one side and the main house on the other, and, and how you um, might uh, mitigate the effect of a road in between. And so we, we kind of created a tower. It's a very steep hill on, on the lower part of this 
side, so the house goes up a number of stories and has a garage that kind of helps edit out carport and helps edit out the the drive. Uh, so, and this is a very skinny little section of a house, just one room wide. All the rooms have access from the outdoors. Uh, you can do that on a vacation place like this. The grand hall is is really an open air stair that goes up through kind of a perforated metal piece. Um, but one of my favorite things on this project was we had a really, really steep hill. So we had this one interesting environment of a steep, um, uh, very arid hill on one side and then this beautiful lush uh, lake on the opposite side. So the house uh, with a simple bridge bridges back into that uh, terra firma and, and uh, enjoys the, the land on one side and then the floating, um, the floating deck on the other. Uh, and this is our friend. And so the ultimate sixth landscape, if you can count it, is the urban landscape. And for uh, Westerners, um, it's probably one of the most fragile landscapes. We've always treated the land uh, with, with thin respect, and we've always felt like we had more, more land than we knew what to do with. And so we, sprawl has always been the name of the game. And so we're now finally, you know, coming back to the centers of our cities, and certainly in Texas, I know it's happening here. And, in, in Albuquerque and in Santa Fe, uh, but a lot of our, we do a lot of uh, inner city uh, development. And uh, this is a, uh, about a 30 acre site in the center of, in the, just about, uh, well on the San Antonio River in the center part of the city, there was an old abandoned uh, brewery. And, um, and so it was, uh, uh, it was, uh, there was really a whole lot more parking lot than buildings in reality, uh, but we have, over time, this is the kind of densification drawing showing we had a lot of parking lot in this space before, and just imagining what, where the buildings would go and what the spaces in between would be like, and how you introduce cars, um, how you introduce people, how you have a really vibrant space. Uh, this has been a transformative project for San Antonio. It's, it's had ripple effects in a lot of the neighborhoods around it. Uh, but one of the great things is the San Antonio River goes right by it. So thinking about how we would interface with the river, creating a, an amphitheater along it, um, and the, these new buildings. Um, we did the master plan for this. We did a lot of the early buildings. Um, and we created a kind of an attitude about how to, how to work here at this brewery site. Um, but since then, the owners have, have worked with other architects, and but because we set up a, a, a direction and an attitude, it has actually, I think, even benefited by having other hands uh, work on this project, because it's got uh, probably more variety than it would have had a, that had been done by the single hand of one firm. Um, but it's been a delightful thing to watch and change, uh, and we've worked with a number of really uh, great landscape architects, but Christy Tenai, but also a local firm, um, Jim Gray's firm here in San Antonio on this. Um, and I'm, I don't know, I'm zipping, zipping kind of through these, but the, uh, the idea of a project like this is you don't build it at once. And so thinking about what a parking lot can be, um, that, that it can be a farmer's market, just thinking of how to create a dynamic place before you finished it. So a smart master plan to begin with, uh, an attitude about preserving as much of the heritage of an old industrial site. So what we recommended to them is if you did tear a building down for whatever reason, to save all the elements, and so they did, they put them in a warehouse, and then later when people do restaurants, they recycle some of those elements from, from the past, from birth. The, but, but also we, we work very closely with the client on how to program that space, and we continue to do that. And we uh, not only took on the master plan to think about where things would go, but we also traveled the country to look at, at successful examples. So we took a lot of responsibility on for making uh, an important urban space. And another project that we just recently finished is, uh, is a little theater in, um, in downtown Houston in the, in the arts district on their train line. Uh, here, this was a building for a lot of the homeless arts groups. Um, it had five different theater venues. 
Um, and the idea was that that would be a shared facility. It was a new idea, a shared facility by many, many different art groups. So one office area that they could all share, and then these um, more flexible kind of black box spaces. Um, and the idea here was creating a, um, a big lobby space that would, um, that would be um, open and inviting and instead of doing a traditional air conditioned lobby space and even though this was Houston, we were able to, uh, and, and part of that was budget as well, but we created a huge big open breezeway uh, with the thought that you could go to the front door of these five different arts venues instead of going into one uh, kind of controlled lobby, you could go to the doors of the five different activities and end up with more of an open dynamic experience uh, and enjoy the, uh, you know, enjoy what kind of weather Houston has. I mean, Houston is a place that if you can have shade and you can have fans, which is what this space had. In this case, it was all light steel. We felt very important that it felt light and cool in Houston uh, and big, big open air spaces and uh, getting given access to these different art spaces. Um, so another kind of urban transformative and some urban, some interior uh, art spaces here called Match. Um, I'm gonna close on, um, our office is now, is now 100 people. We now have two um, locations in, in uh, San Antonio and in Austin. And you might have thought that as an office grows to that size that you might lose you know, some level of, of design. Uh, you might lose the ability to really craft buildings. But in our case, I, I don't think that's been the case because we created a, a strong uh, design philosophy that has been one that, uh, that a lot of people could share. And then their individual perspectives can then enhance that that particular direction. Um, but another wonderful thing about uh, scale of an office is that you can also start doing more things than just architecture. In our case, we, because uh, we've been part of the community in San Antonio and we have a really strong environmental ethos, um, we have found that we, we found it important to do a certain amount of, just a small amount of percentage of our work would go towards um, uh, pro bono work, and uh, but as we did a few of those, we started thinking, gee, if we could really organize uh, a lot of that that volunteerism that we were finding with a lot of our younger architects and streamline it, we could even do more. And so we have organized this effort under what we call the watershed, and it's a and it's kind of what we think of as a think tank. And this is the day that we really figured this out. And we went and did, and uh, this was just this. Um, this is us back at that house that I showed in the early part that we call the Carraro house, which is still one of my favorite houses that we built out of a recycled um, uh, uh, building from a cement plant. And uh, it's out in the country, kind of outside of Austin. Uh, and here we were coming together with the notion of how to, you know, fine tune. We're forever, you know, working on trying to make the office a better place. Uh, but what came out of this was this notion of leveraging a lot of the things that we were already doing, but, but having it more organized. And so one of the things we've been doing um, is we have been now metering our houses. So we do a lot of, of, of you know, a lot of residential work and all over the country. And, um, and it, it used to be that you'd finish a project and photograph it and say goodbye to the client. And, and uh, uh, but now what we do is we uh, put these smart meters on our houses. We pay for these meters ourselves. Uh, if the client wants to keep them afterwards, after a year or so, that they can buy them from us. But otherwise, we then remove them. But what we found is, and, it, and we now do this on, on and as many buildings uh, types as we possibly can, we found that you could, you, you could put an amazing amount, of, and what's happening in this photograph is, is this is, um, we have a small division called the Sustainability Group. Uh, that are not architects, but more engineering types. And here they're putting, they're going into the meters of some house and uh, putting all our smart meters on. And uh, the guy on the right is, is single-handedly figured out all this gear. Uh, and we can, in real time, uh, you know, tell how a house is performing. But most importantly, we found that if we could give the client the tools to understand how the house is performing, that they would ultimately uh, 
that the performance would, would vastly improve. And, and so one is we could improve the performance if you put your client in charge of worrying about it. So you can think where I, I didn't finish the thought process, but you can put a great deal of thought into a highly sustainable architecture, but ultimately it's the user, it comes down to the user on how they're using the building on the real performance. And so by uh, empowering them with the knowledge of how the building is performing, we found that built buildings would, uh, could be uh, greatly increased, their performance could greatly, greatly increase. But one of the really great things though is that we continue to stay connected to our clients a year or so after the project. And that was probably one of the loveliest things about uh, doing this. Um, and then part of our, our donation volunteerism was the this Dixon Water Foundation building. We did this, this was the first, um, uh, this is the uh, first, what is, the, God, I'm now forgetting what, um, what is the greenest of green buildings called when you're living building, yeah. living building yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you John. Um, so this is the very first uh, living building challenge building done in pretty much the central United States. And we did this one, um, we had a great client. Uh, they were paying us a reasonable, very good, reasonable fee for, for doing the design and, and their, 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 uh, their, their goals and aspirations of their foundation is, is water conservation. And this was on a piece of property outside of Dallas um, that is uh, that's working with a, uh, one of the last uh, grass prairies of the area. Um, but we saw an opportunity which is often what we try to do is we saw an opportunity with this particular project that we could do a living building challenge, but we didn't want, this is the very first one we'd ever done, so we didn't want to, um, you know, to shoulder the project with the additional fees that, might, that you might find from doing a living building challenge. And a living building, for those who don't know, is it just means that it's as if the building is, doesn't even exist. So even, the waste water that comes out of the building is then filtered through natural wetlands. There is no energy that's used. The materials that are used are compensated by, um, by, by the amount of energy you're saving. So you're thinking about all aspects of how a building comes together. Pretty, comp pretty complicated and certainly not something that every client would want to do. But anyway, so we did this as a, an, an additional um, uh, percentage uh, 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 donation to just do that extra piece. And so I'm just, uh, it's something that we would have already done. We believe in doing this particular 1% uh, donation anyway, but in this particular case, we were being strategic about a building that really could use it. So we're always being thoughtful, uh, not always just plain just being generous, but we're being thoughtful about that generosity. And so that's why I have that, this building. Uh, and we learned a lot from that. And, and our effort even in this, um, area of housing you know we've been doing houses now for 30 years and we love them and when we first began we used to do them they used to be small and they used to be for neighbors and then now they're for you know they're not so small and they're not always just for your neighbors and 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 so the idea of of trying to get back to doing some of those smaller thoughtful uh, in it, uh, less expensive houses has been something that we've been wanting to do, but it, but we couldn't afford to just do one at a time. So we felt it was important to investigate the notion of, of doing uh, some level of, as we pointed out, this notion of, of prefabrication, the holy prefab. We did a lot of research. Ultimately, what we were doing is we were, and we're still working on it. We it's been through many many iterations. I think we've been now working on it for ten years. Um, but the porch house, uh, which is a series of rooms that are built in a factory that we're now building it in a variety of different ways. But the idea of these rooms could be configured in a variety of ways. They might have major simple consistency, uh, and the idea of the consistency would be affordability, but yet still uh, wonderful magic spaces in between the buildings, uh, a, a building system that would still be highly adaptable to, to whatever sites we were build, building them in, whether they were urban and you'd stack them or, or more rural and you thought about the courtyard spaces. Um, and so that, this, that was the very first one that we did. Um, and then this was one after we did a number of them with a factory and now we're, uh, we're doing them 
for a little while we were doing a number of them with just one of our contractors from scratch because we could find that, that the building system was a really good one that organized a client that made it simple. We could, uh, we could predict exactly how much these buildings cost. And, and then we started realizing maybe it didn't really matter how we built them. And so we started going back to just building as frame houses, traditional manner. Because in this middle time period, we weren't building enough of those to justify having them built in a factory. And so we did a number of them uh, as just wood frame structures, but the same system, because we were forever looking for another way to build more of them uh, so that the price could go down. And then, um, and then we've done them now, we've done them in, in, with SIP panels in, in the Northeast, uh, working with big SIP, with the SIP panel, panel manufacturers. We've done them in, in this case, in a, in a fiery, in the area uh, near uh, Marfa that has had some of the severe fires uh, and way off the grid on this project um, and, and quite a ways from uh, you know, from any kind of urban center. So here, a building that would be completely fireproof, it was all made out of steel sticks um, and, uh, and photovoltaics and getting all its water from the roof and all its energy from the sun. Uh, so this was an off the grid porch house. Um, but anyway, we continue to, and we're now working with a, a much larger company and we're, we're really hoping that we can finally get to scale uh, with these buildings. But sharing this kind of as part of our watershed thing of, of just this idea of research and development as part of combining volunteerism with research and development and ultimately kind of streamlining and, and accomplishing some things that is in addition to just doing uh, our architecture. So this is, uh, I'm gonna close with this photograph of the only building that I've really built for myself, which is this open air pavilion at, at, at this place that we have in the country. Um, this is the crew. We went out one weekend and put a roof on this simple shelter below it. And now it's the, now it, it, um, it is now the, the roof that uh, goes over our uh, big dinner party that we have, that we just had last weekend. Uh, and that's the group right there under the roof. Let's see what we have left. And so this is, in closing, uh, the photograph of a number of years of going out. And you can kind of see how the office has slowly grown. And then this is the, yeah, this is the most recent photograph. Here I am uh, with Katie, my wife, anyway. And finally, what's interesting about this photograph for me is it shows you the middle band is during the, uh, during the drought. Uh, and so we even went out there, and there, this is a river that flows over that dam naturally, and it's always flowed over that dam until the last four or five years um, during what has been a significant drought in Texas. And then finally now, the last two years, it's back and flowing and lovely and happy, and, and, uh, and that's the office. And I want to thank you for, again for inviting me, and I look forward to getting to know the university more over the next fall. questions, but you can also, I, I probably took a little while, uh, but if I didn't and you still have energy, I'm totally excited about answering any questions and I can toss the mic and you can yell. Yeah. 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 So, no, no, so it's a great question. So his question is, you know, how do you, when we start, we started, you know, with a two or three person firm and then, and now we're a hundred person firm and how do you, uh, when you're, when you're doing work that's, you know, pretty finely crafted, how do you maintain that craft and how does it, so I, I um, one is I'd say we've been really, really lucky because we, we uh, or actually we work really hard on who we add to the office. But, um, but one of the things that we were very lucky with is that we were lucky with the very first projects that we started with. They were uh, these houses in the country. 
So they allowed us to, and we didn't have a lot of work, it was in 1984, so there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of distraction. There wasn't an office right around the corner that would have a whole bunch of work, and we were really jealous of them. No, nobody had any work. So we were able to go slow, fine tune, talk about what, you know, what was important to us, and create a real attitude and strategy of what buildings ought to do. And so we tried to make an, uh, you know, a, a, a fairly clear philosophy that, you're, that, that the form of a building should come from the landscape, the weather, um, the building technology, the materials that might be at hand, and, and naturally the client's program, and really asking really thoughtful questions about the client's program to ultimately package all of those. And so two things happened, though, by starting in this slow manner, which is that one, we started kind of, you, you could see that we had a very particular design direction, so a lot of times the clients that would come to us were pretty self-selecting. I mean, they were already edited because they'd seen some of this work. They got published pretty early on. So we were lucky with the clients, because that's the very first, they could show, throw you in all kinds of directions, new clients. And so the new clients, for the most part, were coming to us, embracing uh, what we had to offer, or we spent a whole lot of time uh, talking them into something. And, and ultimately landing where you know we were hoping they would want to go. And then, but the same thing happened with the office as it grew, which is that it was also fairly self-selecting. We, um, we would get younger architects who were coming to work with us, knowing that, that we had kind of a, a philosophy that they enjoyed and liked. And, and then, so that worked out pretty well when you were small. And then as we've gotten larger, uh, the key is, and it's something you have to kind of constantly work on, is we do a lot of design reviews, just like you would do in school. Uh, we'll take a project at Schematic and say, okay, take time for a little bit of review. And you bring in, it's not always you bring in David and Ted, it's you're bringing in others that know that uh, project type that have already worked on something like that. And they come in, and so in the design, in the schematic design, you're talking about, and you're and you're encouraging everyone, the younger architects, or whoever who seems to be kind of running this thing, to um, explain it just like you would in school, pretty simply, um, using you know a rational philosophy. And if they don't have that one, then you kind of poke at it and finally get there. And and then you do in design development, you're maybe bringing in slightly different people for doing that same. Uh, that same effort, and you're trying to do that in a timely fashion so you don't, you know, have to make a big course change. You're doing that at, at, at times where it wouldn't be a surprise to the client uh, for you to have some slightly new ideas. So you're also often doing it right when you're getting the, uh, the contractor is giving you the, uh, you know, the, the estimate at these different stages. So we'll often use course changes in design as the rationale that we're working with the budget at the same time. And, yeah, because a lot of these edits are often thoughtful and streamlining, and so they can easily kind of fall into the category of, of being, th and, and uh, but I, I think one of the, and then, and then detailing, all of those things are, are ones that what you're doing is uh, you're encouraging people to look at past work, and then you're also encouraging them to, um, you know, just to leverage their own excitement and passion because you really want them to own it too. So it's interesting. I find it a little bit sometimes, uh, it reminds me that I feel like I have two clients. I have the regular client and then I have the young architect client and I'm kind of stuck in the middle and then I have to, you know, I have to use an interesting finesse, about as much finesse with the young architect as I do with the client. In fact, it's more nowadays um, and because you don't want to, you, know, you don't want to kill a spirit, you want to be passionate, excited, and it's an interesting, I don't know, right now it's still working, uh, but it's, it's a constant fear that I have. You wake up, oh my God, I haven't seen that project, and oh my God, are you kidding? What are you doing? Uh, so, you know, some of the things maybe are headed off in a funny direction, and some of those are because, you know, you have a really challenging situation, uh, whatever they be, so not everything uh, is but you you try to encourage you know what it you know some projects move the design level of the office to another another location some of them you know kind of keep it kind of flat you know they're not all projects are designed to you know to to land in a whole other world but 
But it is, what I find really exciting, I find it incredibly exciting that when uh, someone else comes up with a really marvelous, neat idea. I mean, there's nothing more fun than having someone else uh, come up with it. So I, I get more joy out of that than, and you get stale, you know, you don't, you're not thinking, I mean, someone like me, I've got you know, all these different projects going on, I'm not thinking about them as much as one person who only has that one project to worry about. So the, the key is, is, is taking enough time, explaining kind of where you're thinking, giving them enough tools, and then going away, and then, and then having them hopefully remember some of those things that you said, but they don't always do that. It's a challenge. <laughs> it's interesting. And now we have two offices, uh, one in Austin, one in, Houston, in, 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 in San Antonio, and they're only about an hour, 15, 20 minutes apart, and, but the reason we did the one in Austin is there's a lot of development going on in Austin. Austin's a young, younger city compared to San Antonio, and uh, a lot of times a younger city is not as imaginative about hiring someone just down the street. They kind of want to hire their own right nearby, and so that was one of the reasons why we've done that office. But it's a little bit isolating, so we have them call in uh, and try to, uh, but events like this are really important. All the Austin guys all showed up for this, and so it was, you know, so a couple of days to, but we're always hiring someone new that I've, you know, just met, you know, this weekend, and so <laughs> trying to figure out, are you permanent, or are you an intern? <laughs> Oh, you know, it's fun. I mean, we have a great, you know, it's a great profession and it's great passion out there. And, and I, I find it, you know, one of the advantages is just that I think we have a, a philosophy that's a little easier embraced by more people. It's not such a personal sculptural approach. Um, um, but there's room for that too. Good question, long answer, but, but a good one. Yes? Yeah, I was just really interested in some of your organizational principles for these different projects and you've worked kind of been about the different landscapes that you've heard in. And I was wondering if some of your success in the environmental stewardship stuff that you guys have done, if you could kind of, uh, if you would credit your addressing the different landscapes, if your success in addressing these different landscapes. Yeah, so the question is, you know, I've talked a lot about the landscape and and how does that maybe connect to performance of buildings? And the way we began uh, all that early work, we never used, I don't think we even used the word sustainability. Uh, I mean, we certainly, David and I both are, you know, semi, you know, 70s hippie types. Uh, but, uh, and so that environmentalism did come from when we were in school, but it wasn't taught as strongly as certainly as it is now. Um, but when we did all these early projects, they were really um, about connecting to the environment. So it was if a building um, could have less conditioned space, it meant that you would then be more comfortable on getting out into the outdoors. And so we found that some of these early houses, we would just condition the bedrooms and some of the big living areas were thought about and were really conceived as open air pavilions. And, and so they were naturally passively cooled. And then we would use cupolas to draw the air through and we'd use, uh, we were thinking about where the, the prevailing breeze came from and the colder north winds and we'd have these rolling doors. And so we had a lot of science, but it was all, you know, it was all theoretical. You know, we never looked at the meter on how much the buildings were really using. Uh, but we were just trying to use as little energy as possible. But mainly it was, mainly it was about creating a comfortable place. And so that approach is, is, gone, is gone all the way through all of our buildings. It's just now what we've done is added more science. So now that we, now we can evaluate our buildings later with meters, but we also had, Corey um, was one of the, uh, we have a sustainability department that, um, Two of them are both, one of them's an architect, one of them's an engineer, that are, and then they have an intern. And so there are three people that we, it's the only traditionally outside consultants that you might have used that are actually inside our office. And so every project uh, is discussed from an environmental standpoint. And, and, and uh, so it's, uh, so, and, and, and what we're doing is trying to evaluate the performance early on. And, and we've learned a lot. We used to think that everything needed to be open air, and we suddenly found out that, uh, you know, in certain climates that are really humid, you know, you, 
outside of Houston, I, I remember discovering not all that long ago, oh, I, I see, it's actually cooler on a porch during the daytime in Houston than at nighttime on a porch. And the reason being is it's a really humid place. And even when the sun's out, you think it'd be really hot, there's more evaporation that happens and therefore there's less humidity. And so that's where science plugs in. You know, that's where Corey was able to show me this graph and tell me I was wrong and it was really great. Um, so, uh, so we've now added a lot more science. And now we have, we now have the ability as projects, the scale of the projects has gone up. We've been able to hire really, really smart consultants now. So, um, but that, but the, but the notion is still there: is that if you can, um, if you're, if you're connecting with the landscape and the place and the weather, and the materials that make sense for the place, that's always what we've done. And then just adding more gears and, and gadgets to make it that much better. Uh, but yeah, that that original connection with just the outdoors uh, is, was a huge driver in the, I think the, uh, and that makes it easier. I, I found, I was talking to the students today in, our, in the class that if you can let things like the weather and a little bit of science drive the form, it's just that much easier. You're, 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 you're not inventing odd things as much. And so for, for a firm to answer yours, it's, that's, that, that, that is one way to kind of keep the work a little simpler, is you just challenge everybody with, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, you know, the set angles here, you gotta have a big overhang, sorry, a little snipped off deal, it might look cool, and it's. <laughs> <laughs> Those are good questions, thanks. That's probably, unless there's one more, we'll, anyway, thank you so much.